Hello, my name is Professor Shilajitya Rakshit, International Criminal Court. Now, what are the prerequisite ob requisites objectives? What are its keywords? We shall all come to know this when we talk about the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court, what is it all about? The introduction of the International Criminal Court states, the setting up of the International Criminal Court, the only permanent international institution of its kind, seated at The Hague, marked a critical moment. And what was the criminal mo critical moment? The critical moment was an international law bringing a sense of permanence to the fluid discipline known as international criminal law. The court represents both a continuity with earlier ad hoc international criminal tribunals and a clear break to the extent that dispensing international criminal justice is no longer perceived as a conceptional measure. This exceptional measure is always from the viewpoint of international law. The Rome Statute is the key document with respect to the court which defines its structure, function and as a matter of substance, its jurisdiction. The Rome Statute therefore is at once a repository of rules of international criminal law and a constitutional document. This module will briefly introduce readers to the history of international criminal law with a view to setting out the context in which the court was set up. This module will also explain key provisions of the Rome Statute pertaining to the jurisdiction of the court, its structure and the method of functioning. Finally, the module will introduce some of the situations which the court is seized of and some of its important cases. What are the learning outcomes? On completing this module, the reader is expected to understand a. The development of international criminal justice system from an ad hoc tribunals to the court. 2. The key provisions of the Rome Statute with respect to the jurisdiction of court. 3. The structure of the court with particular reference to the judges and the office of the prosecutor. Also, the functioning of the court with particular reference to the manner in which the court takes cognizance of cases. The experience of the court thus far, including some pitfalls, challenges and criticism. Now, what is the background? Arguably, most tenets of international criminal law can be traced to the idea of prosecuting war criminals for violations of the laws of armed conflict. Just ad bellum is the Latin term in modern times known as international humanitarian law. This sort of prosecution has an ancient and a medieval history, but the international enforcement of laws of armed conflict throughout the first decade of 19th century was mostly informal. The idea of a formal enforcement mechanism can be traced to the call for an international tribunal by Gustave Monnier. Gustave Moynier was one of the founders of the Red Cross. In 1872, along the long road to the court, 
The next important milestone that ought to be noted is the formation of a body called the Allied Commission at the end of the First World War, which was charged with the responsibility to address liability. This liability was for specific war crimes. Its efforts and recommendations were finally subsumed in the Peace Treaty of Versailles, concluded in 1919. After the hopes of lasting peace in the era of the League of Nations were dashed, following the devastation of World War II, international criminal law and the method of international adjudication. Both of this was with respect to crimes committed in a situation of an armed conflict. And this took firm hold with the Nuremberg and the Tokyo trials. During the League era, there were attempts spearheaded by Baron Descamp to institutionalize an international court for criminal cases. But these failed owing to a lack of consensus among states. The brutality of the First World War and the brutality of the World War II especially and the result turned the tide. Despite objections over the ex post facto nature of the prosecutions and the apparent concern of victor justice being delivered, Nazi and Japanese war criminals were tried at Nuremberg and Tokyo. They were tried by the International Military Tribunal and the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. While moral costs were paid in the form of overruling the aforesaid objections to his jurisdiction on tenuous grounds, these trials firmly entrenched a belief, an idea, that institutional mechanisms could be set up to fasten individual liability or responsibility for criminal acts or violations of the laws of armed conflict. Thereafter, early efforts by the United Nations to settle on an international criminal court failed owing to the Cold War era as disagreements between the Warsaw Pact and the NATO emerged. In the last decade of the 20th century, two tribunals contributed significantly to the development of international criminal jurisprudence. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, that is the ICTY, and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, called ICTR. The ICTY in particular is influential, very influential, not just for the case it decided, but for codifying international crime in its statute that were beyond any doubt a part of customary international law. These efforts moved international law and international criminal law beyond the question of legitimacy. Now here we come to the Rome Statute, which is essential to understand the functioning of international courts and tribunals. The Rome Statute is the founding document defines the jurisdiction of the court, apart from prescribing its structure and function. When the statute came into force alongside, it were adopted two further documents that are crucial to the adjudication of cases by the court. The rules on procedure and evidence, and most importantly, the elements of crime. Substantively, the most crucial provisions of the Rome State, or the Rome Statute rather, sorry, are those 
which define the jurisdiction of the court. Broadly, jurisdiction can be divided into questions of non-personal jurisdiction, that is rationa personae, temporal jurisdiction, that is rationa temporis, and territorial jurisdiction, that is rationa loci or loci, however you pronounce it. And then the subject jurisdiction, that is rationa materi. In plain words, the statute determines questions about the jurisdiction of the court with respect to the persons who may be tried, the time period for the crimes, the place of occurrence of the crime, as well as the commission, and the nature of crimes which have been committed. As a general rule, the court has jurisdiction over crimes committed on the territory of a state party to the statute, irrespective of the nationality of the perpetrator. Simultaneously, the court also has jurisdiction over nationals of state parties to the statute irrespective of the place of commission of the crimes. When exercising jurisdiction over the crimes on a territorial basis, the court may be called upon to examine the understanding of the term territory, its limitation in cases of disputed territories as also what amounts to commission of the crime on a territory. There are several pockets of disagreement in international law over this question. For example, when a conspiracy to commit a crime on a territory is hatched outside thereof, whether the crime would be considered to have been committed on such a territory, given that some part or some state adopts an FX doctrine to deal with territorial connection to the crimes. Similarly, when exercising jurisdiction based on the nationality of a perpetrator is a difficult question to the court, and the court faces the effective nationality of the perpetrator. This may call upon the court to decide questions about the connection of an individual ter territory and what amounts to an effective connection. There are some exceptional rules to the jurisdiction spelt out in the above example. For example, states may on an ad hoc basis for particular crimes accept jurisdiction of the court irrespective of the fact that the state is not a member state to the Rome Statute. It has been argued that what in such cases states can only accept jurisdiction with respect to a crime committed on its territory by its national uh, persons. The jurisdiction of the court with respect to individuals who are entitled to certain forms of immunity under international law is an interesting question. Two provisions of the Rome Statute make it clear that on the one hand, the immunity of a person owing to his or her official capacity is no bar to the jurisdiction of the court. This is on one hand. While on the other hand, if a state does not surrender an individual of a different nationality, then its own owing to an obligation of a granting immunity 
award to a third state. The court cannot proceed with this request. Now, the simple implication of this is that national of non-party states are likely to benefit from immunities under international law as would be the case with President al-Bashir of Sudan. This provision has been oddly extended by the United States through various treaties with other states to cover all nationals of the United States irrespective of their official capacity. This is a curious device and has certainly stretched the scope of the exception. And this exception is under the Rome Statute. On the question of temporal jurisdiction, the court is different from earlier and hoc international tribunals. While in each earlier case, starting from the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials, the international tribunals and importantly, its constitutional document defining the crimes were brought to existence after the relevant crimes had been committed, that is, ex post facto. The Rome Statute applies to crimes prospectively. The court does not have jurisdiction as a general rule to try criminal actions that take place before the date when the statute was came into operation. That is basically July 1, 2002. Again, on ad hoc basis, when non-party states extend jurisdiction of the court to particular crimes, the rule of prospective application may not strictly apply. On a related note, the statute makes it clear that no person can be tried for an act which, very importantly, is not at the time of its commission a crime within the definition of the statute. Article 6 through of the statute define the subject jurisdiction of the court. That is, the specific crimes which may be tried by the court. These crimes briefly listed in Article 5 are the crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. The acts that constitute each of these crimes are listed on Article 6 through Further, as a tool of interpretation, Article 9 of the statute makes it clear Then, when interpreting and applying Article 6 through the statute, the court will refer to the adopted document known as the element of crime. It is, however, beyond the scope of this module to address each crime in detail, but the following general points ought to be taken into consideration. Genocide refers to the acts of killing, causing serious bodily injury and mental harm, inflicting conditions on a population that physically destroys its, imposing forcible measures preventing birth and forcible transfer of children of members of an identifiable national group, which whether it is ethnical, religious, or racial group. These acts must be accompanied by the intention, that is, the animus, to destroy the group in whole or in part. Crimes against humanity refer to a broader set of crimes than those covered by genocide. 
While the physical acts are somewhat similar and involve murder, extermination, enslavement, forcible dep deportation, etc., etc., rape, sexual slavery, the list is more extensive and also includes apartheid, enforced disappearance, persecution, and other inhuman acts. These crimes need to be widespread and systematic in the sense that they are directed against the civilian population. War crimes. War crimes amongst genocide and crimes against humanity is the oldest of international crimes and are defined as grave violations of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and customary laws applicable to armed conflicts. Several specific acts are listed as war crimes under the statute. The crimes of aggression was inserted by an amendment to the statute on 11 June 2010 and captures acts that constitute aggression as a manifest violation of the United Nations Charter. What are the structure and function? This section will review the judicial structure of the court, a judicial function and functioning of the office of the prosecutor. It is important to turn to the functioning of the prosecutor first because this has relevance to the manner in which the jurisdiction of the court is triggered. In early ad hoc tribunals, the question of triggering jurisdiction was largely relevant. Irrelevant because the crimes in question had already been committed. Here, it is a matter of concern of when and exactly what time should the court take cognizance of the situation. Given that the court's functioning is ultimately linked to the consent of states, the first trigger mechanism is when a state party itself refers a situation to the court for it to take cognizance. In these situations, the referring state itself gives up on any claim of local jurisdiction over the crimes in question and defers to the mechanisms of the court. The second triggering effect or second triggering mechanism is to a resolution of the Security Council referring a situation to the court. The third and the most innovative aspect of the court's functioning is that the prosecutor can prior, prior motu on his or her own initiative commence investigation into any situation with a view to ultimately prosecuting the matter before the court. So these are the three broad areas. The procedure the court follows have been described as a hybrid of the common law adversarial approach and the inquisitorial system of the Romano-Germanic legal systems. Any case before the court goes through a pre-trial stage that involves investigation, arrest and surrender and confirmation. Then there is a trial stage and an appellate stage. At the trial and appellate stages, the procedure is somewhat closer to the adversarial system. In order for a case to be tried by the court, the first step is for the prosecutor to commence an investigation. Secondly, this is done with a view to collect enough evidence in order to bring a prosecution. 
in situations that are preferred by state parties or by the Security Council, the prosecutor ought to directly proceed. However, when the prosecutor intends to commence investigation, proprio motu, he or she must obtain order to commence investigation from the judicial division of the court. The division concerned with granting such orders is called the pre-trial chamber. Further orders during the investigation phase critically for obtaining arrest warrants or summonses to appear may be obtained by the prosecutor and this he or she applies by applying to the pre-trial chamber. The court, if you observe, is divided into four main organs. The presidency, the three judicial divisions, appeals, trial and pre-trial, the office of the prosecutor and the registry. In the paragraphs above, the unique function of the prosecutor have already been noticed. The judges who form the judicial organ of the court elect amongst themselves the president, the first vice president and the second vice president. Together, these three form the presidency of the court concerned and mainly with the allocation of judicial work. The judicial function of the court is mostly discharged by its three divisions, the appellate, trial and pre-trial chambers. The appellate chambers composed of the president and four other judges sits in bank decide appeals from decisions of the trial chambers and certain decisions of the pre-trial chambers. The trial and pre-trial chambers are mandated to be composed of not less than six judges. These chambers sit in divisions of these three judges, but the pre-trial chamber may sit through a single judge. Some of the functions of the unique pre-trial chambers like authorizing investigation and issuing warrants have been till date noted above. The pre-trial chamber also considers question of releasing accused pending their trial. Pre-trial chambers holds a confirmation hearing in each case as if to preliminary confirm charges before committing the case to trial. This procedure is expected to filter out any case where prosecution and some would be vexatious or vindictive. The trial on evidence of each case takes place before the trial chamber and appeals are then made or carried forward to the appellate chambers. Admission of cases and principles of criminal responsibility is the next topic. Two further crucial aspects of the Rome statutes that are critical to the functioning of the court are thus the rules that govern the question of admissibility and the principles of criminal law that the court applies to all cases. The Rome statute draws a distinction between questions of jurisdiction which have been discussed above and that of admissibility. It is possible thus that a case while fulfilling all jurisdiction requirements 
may still not be admissible. The main principles concerned with admissibility has been described as the principle of complementarity, which is supposed to mean at the core of the court and its very foundations. In other words, or in simple terms, the principle requires that a case can be brought before a court when the relevant national jurisdiction is unwilling or genuinely unable to prosecute it. This principle addresses any conflict that may arise between national and the international jurisdiction. There is an additional requirement in the admissibility calculus. This is known as the principle of gravity. By the words of the statute, it appears to imply that there is an independent requirement that the crime must be committed at a sufficiently grave level to merit an international prosecution. Notwithstanding the fact the elements of the crime have been formally fulfilled. However, a very early decision of the appeals or the chamber appeals to have raised some questions as to whether gravity is an independent factor in the analysis. Given that the crimes under the Drome statute by their very definition are grave and unusually heinous. Article 21 of the Rome Statute deals with sources of law for the court. Unlike Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, Article 21 here creates a hierarchy between sources. The Rome Statute, elements of crimes and the rules on procedure and evidence. All these are to be applied as the highest sources of law. Apart from this, followed by international treaties, principles and the rules of international law and law of armed conflict and finally the court may draw general principles from national legal systems. Article 22 through 33 of the statute codify substantive but general rules of international criminal law. They are applicable to any international criminal trial. Some of these provisions are continuations from the constitutional documents of earlier while some others are improvements or are entirely new given that several principles of international criminal law emerged from the voluminous jurisprudence of ad hoc international tribunals uh, which were prevailing before. Some of these principles concerning immunity and non-retroactivity have been noted earlier. The statute also codifies grounds for excluding criminal responsibility, general defences and critically codifies rules that govern responsibility of military commanders, that is the concept of respondent superior and superiors. The court in action, situation and cases, nine situations have till date been brought before the court. The word situations here refers to an armed conflict or the occurrence of one or more than acts that constitute crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. 
within each situation the prosecutor may bring one or more cases against one or more responsible individuals the nine situations the ones in congo uganda the other situations in central african republic and mali were referred to the court but the state parties themselves the security council has referred situation in darfur sudan and situation in libya and the prosecutor has commanded investigation and commenced investigations in these cases the prosecutor has commenced proprio motu investigations authorized by the pre trial chamber in kote kenya and the ivory coast of the nine situations listed above the situation in congo have witnessed the largest number of individual cases in the two most prominent cases decided by the court against thomas lubanga dialo and germin katanga the trial chamber has pronounced guilty verdicts which have been confirmed on appeals and sentences have been handed out as well as pronounced one interesting aspect of the court's functioning is the concern for victims of crimes in the judicial process the rome statute provides a mechanism for victim participation and the entitlement of victims to repartitions with the leave of the court victims are entitled to be heard at any stage of the proceedings before the court provided that their participation does not prejudice the right of the accused to a free and fair trial several victims have been granted compensation and leave to be heard as in the dialo case despite it having become quite obvious that deciding the procedural aspects of their participation is both time consuming and costly as a part of his decision making process apart from the handing out of punishments the court is empowered and to order repartitions to victims either directly from perpetrators or from a trust fund set up by the state parties for the purpose in dialo case an initial order for repartitions was made by the trial chambers but that order has since been modified and by the appeal chambers and the trust fund for victims is now mandated to prepare a new proposal for repartitions but there is a certain criticism giving its uniqueness as an international institution the court in terms of its structure power and work thus far has been subjected to some criticism state parties during the times of drafting of the rome statute disagreed over several critical provisions of the statute reflecting in many ways their domestic concepts of the appropriate actions on the scope of international criminal law one form of international criticism of the court has been that despite its powers the court's functions may be restricted or thwarted by the efforts of sovereign states and that ultimately the court 
has not eroded the paramount role of state consent in international law. Given the accused persons under international uh, criminal law are often powerful officials, the ultimate reliance on state consent presents a unique challenge to the courts. For example, the courts reliance on national authorities for arrest and or surrender of the accused per exit probable in most cases that several perpetrators will be able to avoid the court's jurisdiction with absolute impunity. Further, as a realistic matter, the court's future is also independent on a change of attitude of the United States towards it. Till date, USA continues to count as an opposing voice given its concern over the court overreaching into matters which of domestic jurisdiction, etc., etc. The United States, through various legal instruments, have been able to completely insulate its nationals from the jurisdiction of the International Court and the International Criminal Court, for example. And these continue to be hindrance for the court. On a different note, there have been clear voices which state uh, against the court for its emphasis in situations in Africa, showing an obvious tendency or a trend of asymmetry of power in international relations and a possible Western approach or a Western bias in its functioning. To summarize, the International Criminal Court is one of the most significant institutional instruments in international law, making a new point of departure for international criminal law. Till its formation, international criminal justice had been delivered through ad hoc tribunals like Nuremberg and Tokyo, which are constituted after commission of crimes which has always been a suggestion and a question-begging move in international law. Unlike its predecessor tribunals, the court applies, which is very innovative, the provisions of its constitutional document like the Rome Statute prospectively. The Rome Statute is an extensive repository on substantive aspects of international criminal law, apart from providing for the structure and function of the court, the statute defines the crimes within the jurisdiction of the court, which are genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression. It also codifies several general principles applicable in international criminal law and defines the jurisdiction of the court. The court procedure is a hybrid and inquisitorial systems. Thank you.